Good evening, everybody. If there's anyone here who might not know, I'm Brad Kraft, and I'm a bookseller here at the University Bookstore. Now, no one who knows me will be the least surprised to see a stack of out-of-print books at my elbow, as it were. Out-of-print books, one might say, are something like my mission in life, and yes, non-believers can have a mission. One of the reasons I read aloud, one of the reasons they let me, is in a way to raise the dead. Well, we're here this evening for William Cooper. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his great designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The blood may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. Those may well be the most famous verses William Cooper ever wrote. They are the words of a hymn. It is as a writer of hymns that the poet is now best remembered. Cooper never wrote a note of music, yet he did write dozens of religious verses specifically to be set to music as contributions primarily to what became known as the Olney Hymns. This and another that starts, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Oh. These are still widely sung in choral arrangements, in Protestant churches, gospel and evangelical circles, and by a wildly diverse collection of performers on YouTube. With music as different as bluegrass and shape note, adult contemporary Christian, whatever that means, and Spanish guitar. All of which takes us the long way round, my apologies, to the central question posed by this evening's reading. Now, why should I, not a religious man, a man who doesn't sing, or rather ought never to sing in public, how do I come to be here reading aloud from the works of William Cooper, spelled C-O-W-P-E-R, but pronounced with the usual English perversity, Cooper. It would seem we have a paradox, let's call it. A paradox like this reading, very much of my own making, I admit. How then should I, a most secular if eccentric reader, come to be reading the poetry of a devout, largely out of print, 18th century evangelical Christian, let alone reading it aloud to you? Well, the larger and more pompous answer is that we're here because I enjoy reading aloud and believe sincerely that only in doing so may we fully appreciate the best expression, the true music in literature. Huff puff. The short answer, at last, is that I love William Cooper. I've been reading his poetry and his letters and his various biographies for some years now. He fascinates, frustrates, entertains, and moves me. I love his letters. I like his poetry. I've come to admire this most unhappy, funny little man, sitting in a narrow room, in a narrow little house, in a narrow little town, surrounded by narrow company, sitting in a second-hand chair at a flimsy card table, writing, 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 in an odd cotton nightcap, with a bird on his shoulder, and a dog at his knee, and with rabbits gambling about his feet. I like him. I like his company. I like his company so much, in fact, that I now count him among that irregular group of writers, my familiars, let's call them, of whom I've come to think of as my dead friends. <laughs> no friendship will abide the test that stands on sordid interest, or mean self-love erected, nor such as may a while subsist between the sought and sensualist for vicious ends connected who seek a friend should come disposed to exhibit in full bloom disclosed the graces and the beauties that form the character he seeks, for tis a union that bespeaks 
reciprocated duties. Call tonight's reading then, Reciprocity. William Cooper was born November 26, 1731, in Berkhamsted, Hertfordshire. His father was an Anglican priest, the rector of the Church of St. Peter. His mother, Anne Cooper, died, giving birth to his younger brother John, himself to become a clergyman, and the only other of Anne's five children to survive to adulthood. William was six years old when his mother died. His mother's death was to be the first and central tragedy of the poet's life. Here, from two letters written decades later to friends, the second of whom had sent him a portrait of his mother as a gift. To Lady Hesketh, dated the Lodge, February 26, 1790. I am delighted with Mrs. Bottom's kindness in giving me the only picture of my mother that is to be found, I suppose, in all the world. I had rather possess it than the richest jewel in the British crown, for I love her with an affection that her death, 52 years since, has not in the least abated. I remember her, too, young as I was when she died, well enough to know that this is a very exact resemblance of her, and as such, it is to me invaluable. Everybody loved her, and with an amiable character so impressed upon all her features, everybody was sure to do so. And to his cousin, Mrs. Bottom, the next day, on unwrapping her gift. I received it the night before last and viewed it with a trepidation of nerves and spirits, somewhat akin to what I should have felt had the dear original presented herself to my embraces. I kissed it and hung it where it is the last object I see at night and, of course, the first when I open my eyes in the morning. She died when I completed my sixth year, yet I remember her well and am an ocular witness of the great fidelity of the copy. I remember, too, a multitude of maternal tendernesses which I received from her and which have endeared her memory to me beyond expression. Hers were to be the last tendernesses he was to know for many, many years. At seven, he was sent away to Westminster School. He was a good student, learned quickly, and loved his Greek and his Latin. However, it was at school that the painfully shy and physically fragile boy was so relentlessly bullied, and by one older boy in particular, that he would confess years later to remembering only the buckles on his tormentor's shoes, never having had the courage to look up at his bully's face. Shyness and a deep aversion to arguments or violence of any kind were to remain a conspicuous feature of his personality thereafter. Vociferated logic kills me quite. A noisy man is always right. I twirl my thumbs, fall back into my chair, fix on the wainscot a distressful stare, and when I hope his blunders are all out, reply discreetly, to be sure, no doubt. He went to Cambridge. He studied law and was called to the bar, but never really practiced his profession thereafter. Instead, he read and wrote poetry and letters, always letters. While still a solicitor's apprentice, William fell in love with his cousin, to whom he addressed many not very distinguished love poems, calling her his Theodora. Sadly, the, coven, the cousins were forbidden to marry by the girl's father, ending, so far as we know, his only romance. There's little reason to doubt that Cooper was chaste the whole of his life. Here, a rather wry poem of much later date on this debacle. No sorrow peculiar to the sufferer. The lover in melodious verses his singular distress rehearses, still closing with a rueful cry, was ever such a wretch as I. Yes, thousands have endured before all thy distress, some happily more. Unnumbered Coriodons complain, and Strephons of the like disdain. And if thy Chloe be of steel, too deaf to hear, too hard to feel, not her alone that censure fits, nor thou alone hast lost thy wits. It was some time after this dis disappointment, and suffering what was described in the language of his day as a severe and persistent melancholy, that Cooper made the first of three suicide attempts. This, in turn, led to his first confinement in the madhouse. Typically, when he was put away, Losing all his belongings down to his books, papers, money, and most of his clothes, his one thought was for his ill-tempered cat. 
Even in his insanity, he made sure of a safe home, safe home for her. Stroke pushes back the wrong way, he wrote sadly to his friend, and it will put her in mind of her master. Now I'm going to say something uncharacteristic that I have come nonetheless to sincerely believe. Were it not for religion and rabbits, we might never have heard of poor benighted William Cooper. I am nobody, he had once laughingly said to a college friend, and shall always be nobody, and he quite nearly was. One day, while confined, he happened on a Bible, left rather artfully on a bench in the garden to which he frequently retired. It was in consequence of this, so the story goes, that he had his religious conversion. William Cooper was saved. Again, not an experience with which I have had much truck myself, despite having answered an altar call when I was 11 or 12. But for William Cooper, when he found God, he found not only his salvation, about which more anon, but the whole shape and pattern of his life thereafter. He found among his fellow evangelicals a community, a home, and a purpose. To rejoice day and night, as one of his biographers put it, was all his employment. Having temporarily recovered his wits, he then, through mutual friends, made the acquaintance of the Reverend Morley Unwin, once rector of Grimston, and the Reverend's much younger and livelier wife, Mary. In a letter to a friend, Cooper first describes this remarkable woman who was to save his life many times thereafter as having had a very uncommon understanding, has read much to excellent purpose, and is more polite than a duchess. With the Unwin family, he found a house full of peace and cordiality. It was with this family that Cooper was to make his home for the rest of his life. It was also at this period that Cooper found his other great friend and collaborator, the evangelical preacher and former slave trader, the Reverend John Newton, the author of what we now think of as that most American of hymns, Amazing Grace. Together they would publish the hymns that secured their immortality. For a time then, after a fashion, Cooper rejoiced in his salvation. O oh, glory in which I am lost, too deep for the plummet of thought, on an ocean of deity tossed, I am swallowed, I sink into naught. When his friend, the Reverend Unwin, died unexpectedly, Cooper stayed on with Mary. He stayed the rest of his life. Though there was some talk of their marrying, it never happened. They were better friends, so. When Mrs. Unwin moved house, Cooper went too. They followed the Reverend John Newton to Olney, a poor and rather ugly place where the minister had a living, as they say, and where he kindly found Mrs. Unwin and friend Cooper a house just across the courtyard from his rectory. That little house is now the Cooper and Newton Museum, by the way. There it is. And it was there that Cooper was to spend his happiest days and there where he made his famous contributions to the Olney hymns. It was there, in a sitting room that measured about nine by nine, that the poet was to write most of the poems and letters that have made his name. Pardon me. The Pineapple and the Bee. The pineapples in triple row were basking hot and all in blow. A bee of most discerning taste perceived the fragrance as he passed. On eager wing, the spoiler came and searched for crannies in the frame, urged his attempt on every side, to every pane his trunk he applied. But still in vain the frame was tight, and only pervious to the light. Thus having wasted half the day, he trimmed his flight another way. Methinks, I said, in thee I find the sin and madness of mankind. To joys forbidden man aspires, consumes his soul with vain, vain desires, Folly the spring of his pursuit, and disappointment all the fruit. While Cynthia ogles as she passes, the nymph between two chariot glasses, she is the pineapple, and he the silly, unsuccessful bee. The maid who views with pensive air the show glass fraught with glittering ware, sees watches, bracelets, rings, and lockets, but sighs at the thought of empty pockets. Like thine, her appetite is keen, but ah, the cruel glass between. Our dear delights are often such, exposed to view, 
but not to touch. The sight of our foolish hearts in flames, we long for pineapples in frames. With hopeless wish one looks and lingers, one breaks the glass and cuts one's fingers. But they whom truth and wisdom lead can gather honey from a weed. The company and the country suited him. This from retirement. Some minds by nature are averse to noise and hate the tumult half the world enjoys. The lure of avarice or the pompous prize that courts display before ambitious eyes. The fruits that hang on pleasure's flowery stem. Whatever enchants them are no snares to them. To them the deep recess of dusky groves of forest where the deer securely roves, the fall of waters and the song of birds and hills that echo to the distant herds are luxuries excelling all the glare the world can boast and her chief favorites share. With eager step and carelessly arrayed, for such a cause the poet seeks the shade. From all he sees he catches new delight. Pleased fancy claps her pinions at the sight. The rising or the setting orb of day, the cloud that flits or slowly floats away, nature in all the various shapes she wears, frowning in storms or breathing gentle airs. The snowy robe her wintry state assumes, her summer heats, her fruits and her perfumes, all, all alike transport the glowing bard, success in rhyme, his glory and reward. He wrote little poems, mostly, to please himself, to please his friends. He wrote about himself sometimes, even when he didn't know he did the snail. To grass or leaf or fruit or wall, the snail sticks close nor fears to fall, as if he grew there, house and all, together. Within that house, secure, he hides, when danger imminent betides of storm or other harm besides of weather. Give but his horns the slightest touch, his self-collecting power is such, he shrinks into his house with much displeasure. Where'er he dwells, he dwells alone, except himself has chattels none, well satisfied to be his own whole treasure. Thus hermit-like his life he leads, nor partner of his banquet needs, and if he meets one only feeds the faster. Who seeks him must be worse than blind, he and his house are so combined, if finding it he fails to find its master. So he wrote. He was not entirely idle otherwise. He taught himself carpentry and took up furniture making. He fixed a door. <laughs> he made a cupboard. He made Mary a chair as a present. It wasn't very good. He tried his hand at painting, but his eyes were bad and he gave it up. He lived on the charity of relations. They were very poor. They had tea and they had conversation and they were happy. Now stir the fire and close the shutters fast. Let fall the curtains, wheel the sofa round, and while the bubbling and loud hissing urn throws up a steamy column and the cups that cheer but not inebriate wait on each, so let us welcome peaceful evening in. He still had periodic and terrifying depressions. Dark nights of the soul when he became convinced of his own damnation and from which he might not emerge again or say a word for months together. Through all such dark days together, Mary Unwin, his faithful friend, the dearest companion of his soul, would be at his side, would nurse and tend him, would see that he ate, would pray for him when he felt himself beyond the grace of God. He had become convinced of his own damnation. The thought haunted him. He would go to his grave, believing himself damned. Religion had been his salvation but it also became the context for his insanity. Nonetheless, when he would recover himself with Mary's help, he loved life. He came to love nature and walked out into it with Mary every day. Even when he was ill and could not see himself in the mercy of God, he celebrated what he saw as the glory of his creation. Tis morning and the sun with ruddy orb ascending fires the horizon while the clouds that crowd away before the driving wind, more ardent as the disk emerges more, resembles most some city in a blaze, seen through the leafless wood, 
His slanting ray slides ineffectual down the snowy vale, and tinging all with his own rosy hue from every herb and every spiry blade, stretches a length of shadow o'er the field. Mine, spindling into longitude immense, in spite of gravity and sage remark, that I myself am but a fleeting shade, provokes me to a smile. Nature became his chiefest solace and his subject. He took up gardening and discovered he had a knack for it. Eventually, he built a greenhouse in their little backyard that he might, even in winter, grow a few good things and sweet things for their simple table. And when it was nice outside, he would sit out in his shed and write. The Winter Nosegay. What nature, alas, has denied to the delicate growth of our isle, art has in a measure supplied, and winter is decked with a smile. See, Mary, what beauties I bring from the shelter of that sunny shed, where the flowers have the charms of spring, though abroad they are frozen and dead. Tis a bower of Arcadian sweets, where Flora is still in her prime, a fortress to which she retreats from the cruel assaults of the clime. While earth wears a mantle of snow, these pinks are as fresh and as gay as the fairest and sweetest that blow on the beautiful bosom of May. See how they have safely survived the frowns of sky so severe. Such Mary's true love has lived through many a turbulent year. The charms of the late blooming rose seem graced with a livelier hue, and the winter of sorrow best shows the truth of a friend such as you. My dear friend, you will wonder no doubt when I tell you that I write upon a card table, and will be more surprised when I add that we breakfast, dine, sup upon a card table. In short, it serves all purposes except the only one for which it was originally designed. The table was so low, he had to put an old atlas on it to raise it high enough for him to see to write. His friends encouraged him to write as it distracted him from his melancholy. He wrote about all he saw around him, up and down the narrow street, and the park where they walked, and the neighbors, two-footed and four. A neighbor of mine in Silver End keeps an ass. The ass lives on the other side of our garden wall, and I am writing in the greenhouse. It happens that he is this morning most musically disposed, either cheered by the fine weather, or by some new tune which he has just acquired, or by finding his voice more harmonious than usual. It would be cruel to mortify so fine a singer, therefore I do not tell him that he interrupts and hinders me, but I venture to tell you so, and to plead his performance in excuse of my abrupt conclusion. He made friends among the local people, he liked them, good Christians and bad, and they loved him. Though never quite a lawyer, they sought his free legal advice. They listened to him reading aloud. They sang his hymns. When he was very low, unable even to speak, a neighbor, thinking to distract him from his troubles, brought him a rabbit, or rather a leveret, a baby hare. It was soon known, he wrote, among my neighbors that I was pleased with the present, and the consequence was that in a short time I had leverets offered me as would have stocked a paddock. He kept three. He named them Puss, Tiny, and Bess but informs us notwithstanding the feminine appellatives, all three turned out to be males. <laughs> he built them houses and a door into his house, of which they had the free run at night, forcing human visitors to go around and knock at the back for fear of one of the hares escaping. <laughs> one of his funniest letters, in fact, details the mobilization of the whole neighborhood when the irascible Tiny went for a run and was searched for high and low. Eventually, a local farmer found the miscreant and walked him home. In fact, the little house at Olney was crowded with pets. A friend made the following list that in addition to his eight pairs of tame pigeons, his linnet and his robins, he had at one time five rabbits, three hares, two guinea pigs, a magpie, a jay, and a starling, besides two goldfinches, two canary birds, and two dogs. She adds in closing, I forgot to enumerate a squirrel which he had the same time and which used to play with one of the hares continually. He wrote wonderful letters and some very good poems on his dogs and his birds. He wrote one of his most famous poems on the death of his little friend, Epitaph on a Hare. 
Here lies whom hound did ne'er pursue, nor swiftest greyhound follow, whose foot ne'er tainted morning dew, nor ear heard huntsman hello. Old Tiny, surliest of his kind, who nursed with tender care, and to domestic bonds confined, was still a wild jack hare. Though duly from my hand he took his pittance every night, he did it with a jealous look, and when he could, would bite. His diet of wheat and bread, and milk and oats and straw, thistles or lettuces instead, with sand to scour his maw. On twigs of hawthorn he regaled, on pippin's russet peel, and when his juicy salads failed, sliced carrots pleased him well. A turkey carpet was his lawn, whereon he loved to bound, to skip and gamble like a fawn and swing his rump around. <laughs> his frisking was at evening hours, for then he lost his fear, but most before approaching showers or when a storm drew near. Eight years and five round rolling moons he thus saw steal away, dozing out his idle noons and every night at play. I kept him for his humor's sake, for he would oft beguile my heart of thoughts that made it ache and force me to a smile. But now beneath this walnut shade he finds his long last home and waits in snug concealment laid till gentler puss shall come. <laughs> He's still more aged, feels the shocks from which no care can save, and partner once of Tiny's box must soon partake his grave. He wrote to distract himself from insanity, to fill up the day, to amuse and inspire his friends. He wrote of the life around him and in such a way as to secure all but unknowing the reputation of a poet. He would eventually be recognized as the finest and most popular English poet between the classical Georgians like Pope and the coming Romantics. Wordsworth and the rest would eventually claim him and his poetry on nature as the beginning of their revolution. A comparison. The lapse of time and rivers is the same. Both speed their journey with a restless stream. The silent pace with which they steal away, no wealth can bribe, no prayers persuade to stay. Alike irrevocable, both when past, and a wide ocean swallows both at last. Though each resemble each in every part, a difference strikes at length the musing heart. Streams never flow in vain, where streams abound, how laughs the land with various plenty crowned, but time that should enrich the nobler mind neglected leaves a dreary waste behind. And to the nightingale which the author heard sing on New Year's Day, whence it is that amazed I hear from yonder withered spray this foremost morn of all the year, the melody of May. And why, since thousands would be proud of such a favor shown, am I selected from the crowd to witness it alone? Sing'st thou, sweet Philomel, to me, for, I, for that I also long have practiced in groves like thee, though not like thee in song? Or sing'st thou rather under force of some divine command, commissioned to presage a course of happier days at hand? Thrice welcome, then, for many a long and joyless year have I, as thou today put forth my song beneath a wintry sky. But thee no wintry sky can harm, who only needs to sing to make every January charm and every season spring. His poems and his letters eventually secured him more friends and brought him back to the friends of his youth. Despite his struggles, he did his best to amuse and entertain them with all his sweet nat nature and gentle wit in letters and sometimes in epistolary poems. An epistle to Joseph Hill, Esquire, Dear Joseph, five and twenty years ago, alas, how time escapes, tis ever so. With frequent intercourse and always sweet and always friendly, we were wont to cheat a tedious hour, and now we never meet. As some grave gentleman in Terence says, twas therefore much the same in ancient days, Good lack, we know not what tomorrow brings. Oops. Strange fluctuation of all human things. True. Changes will befall and friends may part, but distance only cannot change the heart. 
and were I called to prove the assertion true, one proof should serve a reference to you. Whence comes it then that in the wane of life, though nothing have occurred to kindle strife, we find the friends we fancied we had won, though numerous once reduced to few or none? Can gold grow worthless that has stood the touch? No, gold they seemed, but they were never such. But not to moralize too much and strain to prove an evil of which all complain, I hate long arguments verbosely spun. One story more, dear Hill, and I have done. Once on a time an emperor, a wise man, no matter where, in China or Japan, decreed that whosoever should offend against the well-known duties of a friend, convicted once, should ever after wear but half a coat and show his bosom bare. The punishment importing this, no doubt, that all was not within, and all found out. O oh, happy Britain, we have not to fear such hard and arbitrary measures here, else could a law like that which I relate once have the sanction of our triple state, some few that I have known in days of old would run most dreadful risk of catching cold. While you, my friend, whatever mine should blow, might traverse England safely to and fro, an honest man, close button to the chin, broadcloth without, and warm heart within. And then to the other and some others in prose, on the difficulties, for instance, of living in the country. My dear friend, though I have a deal of wit, and Mrs. Unwin has much more of it, would require more than our joint stock amounts to, to answer all the demands of these gloomy days and long evenings. Books are the only remedy I can think of, but books are a commodity we deal but little in at all me. <laughs> On his love for his friends. My dear cousin, a letter of mine is no sooner sealed and sent than I begin to be dissatisfied with it and to hate it. I have accordingly hated the two letters I have sent you since your departure on many accounts, but principally because they have neither of them expressed any proportion of what I have felt. It is to be hoped that none of my correspondents will measure my regard for them by the frequency, or rather the seldom see, of my epistles. And often as not, he wrote on nothing much. I am writing on Monday, but whether I shall finish my letter this morning depends on Mrs. Unwin's coming sooner or later down with my breakfast. How can one not love such a correspondent? His letters are before me now in these four stout volumes. They are a comfort and a joy. They are among the best letters in English. They deserve more readers. Sitting with Mrs. Unwin and a friend one evening in that little house at Olney, and seeing his spirits sinking, the friend proposed he write a poem. I have no subject, he said. Write then on the sofa, she replied. And so I sing the sofa. <laughs> I who lately sang truth, hope, and charity, touched with awe the solemn chords and with a trembling hand, escaped with pain from the ad that adventurous flight, now seek repose upon a humbler theme. The theme, though humble, yet august and proud, the occasion for the fair commands the song. So begins the poem that, extended to four books, entitled altogether The Task, secured his fame. He was more than 50 before anyone but his few friends ever knew his name. I love him for that, too. Other poems followed and added to his fame. From the solitude of Andrew Selkirk, I am the monarch of all I survey, my right there is none to dispute. From the center all round to the sea, I am lord of the fowl and the brute. O oh, solitude, where are the charms that sages have seen in thy face? Better dwell in the midst of alarms than reign in this horrible place. That's from the solitude of Andrew Selkirk, the story of a famous shipwreck. For all his religious fervor, he was still an educated gentleman of the 18th century and not above a little wit. On an ugly fellow. Beware, my friend, of crystal brook or fountain, lest that hideous hook thy nose. Thou chance to see. Narcissus' fate would then be thine, and self-detested and self thou wouldst pine, as self-enamored he. Or here on a later lady, shall we say, of a certain age, on a battered beauty, hair, wax, rouge, honey, teeth you buy, a multifarious store, a mask at once would all supply, nor would it cost you more. 
He translated Homer, translations in blank verse still in print and still read. He translated the Latin poems of John Milton, his great hero, translated Horace and Ovid. He wrote a comic poem, The Diverting History of John Gilpin, the story, the true story he heard, of a man on a rented runaway horse mistaken for a steeplechase rider. That long, be that long poem became a classic and illustrated long after by Randolph Caldecott, a bestseller all over again. The Caldecott Medal, awarded every year for excellence in illustrated children's literature, if you look closely, is a picture of Cooper's poor John Gilpin bouncing along on his runaway horse. And always, when he sank once more into despair, there was Mary Unwin, his dearest friend, his caretaker, and the partner of his life. When Mary suffered the first of a series of strokes that made her an invalid, even in his madness, he in his turn nursed her. Every day, he walked with her while she could walk, slowly, patiently, round and round their little garden. Only when she died did he at long last disappear completely into that abyss that had threatened him always, and from which neither art nor faith, he felt, could rescue him. To Mary. The twentieth year is well nigh past since first our sky was overcast. I would that this might be the last, my Mary. Thy spirits have a fainter flow, I see them daily weaker grow. Twas my distress that brought thee low, my Mary. Thy needles, once a shining store, for my sake restless heretofore, now rust disused and shine no more, my Mary. For though thou gladly wouldst fulfill the same kind office for me still, thy sight now seconds not thy will, my Mary. But well thou plait'st the housewife's part, and all thy threads with magic art have wound themselves about this heart, my Mary. Thy indistinct expressions seem like language uttered in a dream, yet me they charm whate'er their theme, my Mary. Thy silver locks, once auburn bright, are still more lovely in my sight than golden beams of orient light, my Mary. For could I view them Pardon me, for could I view nor them nor thee, what sight worth seeing could I see? The sun would rise in vain for me, my Mary. Partakers of thy sad decline, thy hands their little force resign, yet gently pressed, press gently mine, my Mary. And then I feel that still I hold a richer store ten thousandfold than, man, than misers fancy in their gold, my Mary. Such feebleness of limbs thou provest, that now at every step thou movest, upheld by two, yet still thou lovest, my Mary. And still to love, though pressed with ill, in wintry age, to feel no chill, with me is to be lovely still, my Mary. But ah, by constant heed I know how oft the sadness that I show transforms thy smiles to looks of woe, my Mary. And should my future lot be cast with much resemblance of the past, thy worn-out heart will break at last, my Mary. A story in the newspaper of a sailor lost at sea inspired his last great poem. Forgive me, it breaks my heart. The Castaway. Obscurus night involved the sky, the Atlantic billows roared, when such a destined wretch as I washed headlong from on board, of friends, of hope, of all bereft, his floating home forever left. No braver chief could Albion boast than he with whom he went, nor ever ship left Albion's coast with warmer wishes sent. He loved them both, but both in vain, nor him beheld, nor her again. Not long beneath the whelming brine, expert to swim he lay, nor soon he felt his strength decline or courage die away, but waged with death a lasting strife, supported by despair of life. He shouted, nor his friends had failed to check the vessel's course, but so the furious blast prevailed that pitiless perforce, they left their outca outcast mate behind and scudded still before the wind. 
Some succor yet they could afford, and such as storms allow, the cask, the coop, the floating cord, delayed not to bestow, but he they knew, nor ship nor shore, whate'er they gave, should visit more. Nor cruel as it seems could he their haste himself condemn, aware that flight in such a sea alone could rescue them. Yet bitter felt it still to die, deserted and his friends so nigh. He long survives who lives an hour, in ocean self-upheld, and so long he, with unspent power, his destiny repelled, and ever, as the minutes flew, entreated help or cried, Adieu. At length his transient respite passed. His comrades, who before had heard his voice in every blast, could catch the sound no more. For then, by toil subdued, he drank the stifling wave, and then he sank. No poet wept him. But the page of narrative sincere that tells his name, his worth, his age, is wet with Anson's tears. And tears by bards or heroes shed, alike immortalize the dead. I therefore purpose not, or dream, descanting on his fate, to give the melancholy theme a more enduring date, but misery still delights to trace its semblance in another's case. No voice divine the storm allayed, no light propitious shone, when snatched from all effectual aid we perished, each alone. I beneath a rougher sea, and whelmed in deeper gulfs than he. Remember that portrait of his mother, the gift of his cousin, the first thing he saw each morning and the last before he closed his eyes at night. It inspired my favorite of his poems. Denied, as he believed, the comfort of God the Father, I hope he might have seen some small comfort at last in his mother's face. Here's the poem. I apologize, I know it's long. Bear with me. On the receipt of his mother's picture. Oh, that those lips had language. Life has passed with me but roughly since I heard thee last. Those lips are thine. Thy own sweet smiles I see, the same that oft in childhood solaced me. Voice only fails, else how distinct they say, Grieve not, my child, chase all thy fears away. The meek intelligence of those dear eyes, Blessed be the art that can immortalize, The art that baffles time's tyrannic claim to quench it, Here shines on me still the same. Faithful remembrancer of one so dear, O welcome guest, though unexpected here, who bids me honor with an artful song, affectionate, a mother lost so long, I will obey, not willingly alone, but gladly as the precept were her own. And while that face renew my filial grief, fancy shall weave a charm for my relief, shall steep me in Elysian reverie, a momentary dream that thou art she, my mother. When I learned that thou wast dead, say, wast thy conscious of the tears I shed? Hovered thy spirit o'er thy soaring sun? Wretch, even then, life's journey just begun. Perhaps thou gavest me, though unseen, a kiss, perhaps a tear, if souls can weep in bliss. And that maternal smile, it answers yes. I heard the bell told on thy burial day. I saw the hearse that bore thee slow away. And turning from my nursery window drew a long, long sigh, and wept a last ado. But was it such? It was. Where thou art gone, adieus and farewells are a sound unknown. May I but meet thee on that peaceful shore, the parting sound shall pass my lips no more. Thy maidens grieve themselves at my concern, oft gave me promise of quick return. What ardently I wished, I long believed, and disappointed still, was still deceived. By disappointment every day beguiled, dupe of tomorrow, even from a child. Thus many a sad tomorrow came and went, till all my stock of infant sorrow spent, I learned at last submission to my lot. But, though I less deplored thee, ne'er forgot. Where once we dwelt, our name is heard no more. Children not thine have trod my nursery floor, 
And where the gardener Robin day by day drew me to school along the public way, delighted with my bobbled coach and wrapped in scarlet mantle warm and velvet capped, tis now become a history little known that once we called the pastoral house our own. Short-lived possession. But the record fair that memory keeps of all thy kindnesses there still outlives many a storm that has effaced a thousand other themes less deeply traced. Thy nightly visits to my chamber made, that thou mightst know me safe and warmly laid. Thy morning bounties ere I left my home, the biscuit or confectionary plum, the fragrant waters on my cheeks bestowed by thy own hand, till fresh they shone and glowed. All this, and more endearing still than all, thy constant flow of love that knew no fall ne'er roughened by those cataracts and breaks that humor interposed too often makes, all this still legible in memory's page, still to be so to my latest age, adds joy to duty, makes me glad to pay such honors to thee as my numbers may, perhaps a frail memorial but sincere, not scorned in heaven though little noticed here. Could time his flight reversed restore the hours, when playing with thy vestures tissued flowers, the violet, the pink, and jasmine, I pricked them into paper with a pin, and thou wast happier than myself the while, would softly speak and stroke my head and smile. Could those few pleasant hours again appear, might one wish bring them, would I wish them here? I would not trust my heart, the dear delight seems to be desired, perhaps I might, but no, what here we call our life is such, so little to be loved and thou so much, that I should ill requite thee to constrain thy unbound spirit into bounds again. Thou as gallant bark from Albion's coast, the storms all weathered and the oceans crossed, shoots into port at some well-havened isle, where spices breathe and brighter seasons smile, there sits quiescent on the floods that show her beauteous form reflected clear below, while airs impregnated with the incense play around her fanning light her streamers gay. So thou with sails how swift hast reached the shore where tempests never beat, nor billows roar. And thy, lovely, and thy loved concert on the dangerous tide of life long since has anchored at thy side. But me, scarce hoping to attain that rest, always from port withheld, always distressed. Me, howling winds, drives devious, tempest-tossed, sails ripped, seems opening wide and compass lost, and day by day some current's thwarting force sets me more distant from a prosperous course. But, oh, the thought that thou art safe, and he, that thought is joy arrive what may to me. My boast is not that I deduce my birth from loins enthroned and rulers of the earth, but higher far my proud pretensions rise, the son of parents passed into the skies. And now farewell. Time unrevoked has run his wonted course, yet what I wished is done. By contemplation's help, nor sought in vain, I seem to have lived my childhood o'er again to have renewed the joys that once were mine without the sin of violating thine. And while the wings of fancy still are free, and I can view this mimic show of thee, time has but half succeeded in his theft, thyself removed, the power to soothe me left. Rest in peace, William Cooper. Thanks for coming, everybody.